this uh, wonderful uh, week after Father's Day. It's just so cool to have a father-daughter team share with us this morning. Luis is a, a former NFL football player and has an extraordinary story of, of redemption. I think redemption might be one of our key words this morning. I'm sensing that already. And Rebecca has an incredible uh, ministry as well. She serves in, uh, with Ford Motor Company, but also has this ministry to uh, others, and she, like me, is a proud uh, lover of the Maize and Blue Michigan Wolverines. Uh, so will you please join me in welcoming Luis and Rebecca Sharp as our keynote speakers. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Can you hear me? Is that on? OK. Wow, what a morning, what a morning it's been. Thank you all for attending here. This is my daughter, Rebecca. Minister Rebecca Sharp, I'm so proud of her. And uh, Pastor Tim, I wanna thank you for that morning joke. That was powerful. You know, isn't it amazing that scripture confirms scripture? How many years between Daniel and Matthew? And, and, and Matthew or Daniel prophesied about Jesus becoming the son of man 80 times in the New Testament, right? The son of man. And you were talking about how he said that he was a servant. You know, I love Philippians 4, 8. It says that let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant and became obedient even to the point of death. You know, the disciples were arguing back and forth among them that who was going to be the greatest among them at, in the kingdom of heaven. You know what Jesus told them? The greatest among you will be the servant of all. Amen. And I am just proud today. My daughter is going to talk a little bit about uh, Juneteenth, and then I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony and about the power of Jesus Christ to change a man's heart and make him that servant. And then we're going to talk about the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, everyone. How are you all feeling today? Oh, come on. That's good for me. But how's everybody feeling today? Okay. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to come um, and just bring you greetings. Happy Juneteenth for those who don't know. Um, so January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And over 900 days later, Union troops reached the southernmost parts of Texas to declare to the enslaved people that they were indeed free. And how many of you all know that he who the sun sets free is free indeed? So today is a day of jubilee. Um, it is a day of celebration, of commemoration, and of education. Um, in 2021, so over 150 years later, Juneteenth actually became a national holiday. And I love this quote by Opal Lee, who was an activist, and she's considered the grandmother of Juneteenth. And she says that when we come together, we can do so much more than we can do on our own. And that sounds a lot like Psalm 133, where the psalmist says that how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. So again, happy Juneteenth. Thank you so much for taking the time to commemorate this day of freedom, this day of jubilee, and this day of celebration. And without further ado, I'll pass it back over to you, Dad. Thank you, Minister Sharp. You know, I want to send out a, a shout out to uh, Newberger. I called him Pastor Paul Newberger because he seems to have a pastor's heart and I've never met him. But, you know, with the emails that he sends us and whenever I have a conversation, you know, I just feel the love of Christ in his words and in, in his ability to articulate and the things that he share and the things that he wants to do. And he reminds me of King David. King David was a man after God's own heart, right? Uh, his brother saw him just as a shepherd out in the field killing lions and bears. But God saw him as a great king. God saw him as a servant leader. God saw him as a warrior. God saw him as a champion, a statesman. And that's why he was anointed. Even though he wasn't a perfect man, he was anointed. He was anointed as, uh, as the next king to follow Saul of Israel. So I just want to thank uh, Newberger, Paul Newberger, for his heart. And he says that we are going together. We are going to cover every inch of the world right? Every inch of the world in Christ, in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to start uh, this uh, keynote speak with Matthew 28, 19 and 20, because that played a significant role in why Rebecca and I are standing here without, with you when I was incarcerated, right? When I was hopeless, dopeless, penniless, right? A former crackhead. 
and people with the same heart as you came into the prison and brought the gospel message, and I accepted Jesus Christ, and he changed my heart. He changed my heart. So it says in Matthew 28, 19, it says to go into all the world. Oh, fatherhood. Oh, yeah, fatherhood. I'm sorry. See, that's why I need my daughter. How many fathers we have? How many fathers we have here? Praise God. Praise God. Well, you know, fathers, I, I just want to say that we are all kings. We are all priests. We are leaders. We are mentors of our children. We are lovers. And isn't it awesome that our children, by example, by example, that we love Jesus, we're able to live our faith and give it away to our children. And I just want to say that there is a battle going on for the lives of our children and our grandchildren. I have a grandson, Rebecca's uh, nephew, that was born two months, or was it three months prematurely? His name is Emmanuel Alfonso. Twelve days of life he's been given. He's a micro preemie. We ask that you pray for Emmanuel Alfonso, right? And I also have a daughter that's living the, what was the, the guy in the, in the Gospels uh, that was living the life apart from his life and, and, and family? The prodigal, living a prodigal life. I have a daughter right now that's apart from her family and from God, and we would ask that you would pray for Emmanuel and our daughter Hannah. And how many know that in this battle that we have, the greatest weapon we have is prayer, right? The effective, fervent prayers of righteous men and women availeth much. And we also have the inspired, living word of God. How many know that the word of God is not just black ink on white paper, right? The word of God is inspired. It leaps from the pages of the scriptures into our hearts and minds and transforms our lives. That's my testimony today. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? That's my testimony today. So in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey whatsoever things I have commanded you. Right now, Pastor Tim, is that a great commission or is that a great suggestion? That is a commission. That is a commandment. That is a commandment to go out. Not only make disciples, but to mark those disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by maturing those disciples, by teaching them to obey whatsoever things he has commanded us. Amen? You know, and, and as I was studying and praying about that, God was telling me, he was saying, listen, if you know that there is a, a, a disease, a sin, that is fatal, right, that is incurable, and you have found the physician, the physician is great, the great Jesus, and you have the, uh, the answer, you have the medicine to cure this fatal and incurable curable disease, how selfish would it be if you kept that to yourself? Jesus Christ has cured me from sin. Jesus Christ has cured me from a life of addiction and pornography and disobedient living. I have to go out and tell the world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen, that Jesus is a deliverer, he is a way maker, he is a chain breaker. Especially in this current world that we're living in, fentanyl crisis, uh, astounding how many young lives are being lost because of this fentanyl crisis. We have to get out and we have to tell the world about Jesus. Thank you so much for that. And from that, I want to go to, how many of you guys are cheeseheads? Any cheeseheads in the audience? How about them cheeseheads? What are you guys going to do this year? Jordan Love. I think Jordan Love. Jordan Love is a great quarterback. You guys have had Aaron Rodgers. You have had uh, Brett Favre. And now Jordan Love looks like he's going to be a, a Hall of Famer someday soon. But what are you going to do when you face our Jared Goff-led Dan Campbell Detroit Lions? <laughs> What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Do you guys know who uh, Lawrence Taylor was? Can anybody tell me what this is right here? A Pro Bowl jersey? And who's Pro Bowl jersey? Lawrence Taylor. <laughs> so LT and I played together in the 1990 uh, NFL Pro Bowl game, okay? And after the game, LT literally took the jersey off his back and he threw it at me and he said, I give you this because nobody fights me as hard as you do. No offensive tackle in the game plays me as well as you do. 
It's my greatest uh, possession that I've, I have. I played with the lowly St. Louis, Arizona Cardinals. We only made one playoff appearance in 13 years that I played with the team, right? Uh, I was blessed uh, to have my peers and coaches vote me as one of the best in the business and reward me with an annual trip to Hawaii three consecutive years. But as a team, we didn't accomplish much. We didn't accomplish much. I had so much success as a 13-year player. Uh, the Pro Bowls, I was uh, captain of the team for 10 of those 13 years. I, uh, I had a television and radio show when I played with the Cardinals. I was an executive committee, committee member of the National Football League uh, Players Association. But what happened when I suffered a career-ending knee, career knee injury in 1994, all of the world's uh, accolades and the applause of, of man for being such a, a great uh, football player and accomplishing great feats on the football field, I was empty on the inside. I didn't know who I was apart from my worldly success. And as a result of that, after my career was over and the bright lights were turned off and all of the applause uh, disappeared, I decided that I was gonna go out in the streets of South Phoenix and smoke crack cocaine right, and, and, and find out who I was, because I didn't know who I was. I was empty on the inside. And how many people know that emptiness on the inside causes separation from God? So I went out into the streets and started smoking crack cocaine, and uh, as a result of that, I, I was shot twice, two different uh, uh, incidences. Both times, the doctors declared it a miracle that I didn't die, that I survived. Uh, I lost my freedom four times, lost my freedom four times. I've had a major heart attack. Nine out of 10 people that have that heart attack don't survive, right? I got beat down in the prison riot. I got beat down in the prison riot. 10 Caucasian men, it was a race riot, jumped me. They had uh, socks and rocks. They were stomping me on my head. I was concussed. They broke my right orbital. I had to have surgery to repair that, right? All because I was living disobediently trying to find who I was, trying to find myself, right? And so what happened while I was in prison at a Bible study, right, somebody that wanted to cover the world in Christ, somebody that believed in the Great Commission to go out into all the world, right, and preach the gospel and make disciples, came in and gave a Bible study. And that was my lowest point. And the Holy Spirit had me go up to the altar and confess that Jesus Christ was Lord and that I believe that God <laughs> raised him from the dead, right? I called out on the name of Jesus. And amazingly, amazingly, after I left that Bible study and I went back to my cell, I started reading the scriptures, the word of God, and this word that I never understood most of my life all of a sudden became alive and I started understanding it. And I started seeing biblical characters like uh, King David, a man after God's own heart, how God used him. Uh, the apostle Paul, a murderer, a persecutor, and a blasphemer, knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus. And God used him to write three quarters of the New Testament. Biblical characters dressed down, not dressed up. And I started having hope that, wow, God, if you can transform their lives, you can do the same for me. And you will do it for me. How many know that we have to see it before we see it if we're ever going to see it? Right? See, what happened with me after I gave my life to the Lord, I started seeing myself here today not with my daughter, but I knew that God had a plan for my life. I knew that God was gonna use my NFL glory and my testimony to go out and share with others that he is the one that they're looking for. He is the one to the problems of addictions, the problems with mental health, right? He is the problem. i never forget, there was a young lady that I was dating. She was a flight attendant. And after all of this happened, you know, I got to be the chaplain's clerk. I would have Bible studies with inmates. I was just on fire for the Lord in prison. I had more joy incarcerated with my freedom taken away than I had when I was a million-dollar star NFL athlete. Because of what? Because of Jesus, because of the word, because of being transformed. So this lady that would come visit me, I would tell her, and here I am serving a, a five-year prison sentence. I'm in my first year. I'm like, God is going to use me. He's going to take me across the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to see other people set free and delivered. God is going to take uh, Romans 8, uh, 28, my brother that shared so eloquently where it says all things work together for good to those that love God and are the call according to his purpose. That was in my heart. 
And I would share that with her, and she would tell me how she would go share that with her flight attendant buddies and pilots, and that they would laugh. Wait a minute. Isn't that the guy that we just saw in the newspaper that they said was a crackhead, he's a football hero, the crackhead zero, and he's going to be traveling across the world in five years when he gets out of prison and doing what? They thought it was funny. <laughs> they thought it was funny. But, but, but you know what? I can tell you this. I couldn't really put, it, put words to what I was experience, experiencing then, but today I know that the Lord became my shepherd. He made me to lie down in, in green pastures. He led me beside the still waters, right? He restored my soul. He began to lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And guess what else? And guess what else? He led me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death in prison, locked up with killers and murderers and child rapists, Yet I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He was with me. His rod and his staff comforted me while I was in prison. When I got beat down in that prison riot, I felt absolutely no pain. I felt no pain until after I was in recovery and they replaced my right orbital. I had surgery and I came out of the concussion. Why is that? Because God was with me. His rod and his staff was comforting me. The scripture is true. The scriptures are real. And get us, well, guess what else he did, Minister Rebecca? Man, God is so awesome that he prepared the table before me in the presence of all those people that said that I was a football hero turned crackhead zero, all the people that were laughing at me because I was saying that I was going to go out and preach the gospel. God began to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. He anointed my head with oil. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Now, here's the best part. What you're seeing here with my daughter and I, right? Surely, goodness and mercy is following us all the days of our lives. And the best part is, guess what? I will dwell, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Is that not good news? <laughs> that is the good news that is the good news, and I, I am just so excited, you know, about all that God is doing in our lives. My daughter and I, uh, we work with the NFL Hall of Fame Health, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and we go across, uh, across the country, and we have these fundraising efforts. My daughter serves as MC at these events with these Hall of Fame players and uh, professionals in the mental health field. She also does uh, red carpet interviews, and she does panel discussions. And we've had a chance, as you see here in the slide, to, uh, to share our testimony and bring glory to God. And, uh, and our aim is to provide services to those that need services and can't afford them. Okay, but our mantra, our mantra is to raise awareness, reduce stigma, transform culture surrounding mental health and substance misuse. And to show people that recovery, redemption, and family reconciliation is completely possible. Amen? Okay, Rebecca, where do we go from here? Are we going to talk about the championship mindset? The championship mindset. You know, I, I'll never forget when I was in college at UCLA, I used to tell my, Rebecca's mom at the time, it was my girlfriend, my freshman year, we used to watch the LA Rams on Sunday, right? I played at UCLA. And I would tell my, my children's mother, I'm better than that guy. That pro bowler right there, left tackle playing with the Rams, I'm better than he is. Again, people laughed, people laughed, but I believe that I was better than he was. And, and, and what I know today, coming from UCLA, and I, by the way, I was born in Havana, Cuba. I came to this uh, country at the age of five years old, didn't speak a word of English. Uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, educated in the uh, public school system, uh, scholarship to UCLA. And, and so uh, the point I want to make is that my mindset, my thoughts, my thoughts determine my words, right? My words determine my actions, my actions, my habits. What were my actions? I worked out in the weight room. I studied my opponent. I studied the pro bowlers on Sunday. I saw myself doing what they did, right? I believed in myself. Those were my actions, and those actions became my habit, became my habit in college, became my habit after I was drafted in the first round by the then St. Louis Cardinals, right? Became my habits, and my habits became my character, 
right? My character, I was an NFL All-Pro, three-time Pro Bowler, before I saw it, before I saw it. Why? Because I believed it in my mind. I believed it in my mind, and my character became my what? My destiny, my destiny. That's how I was able to rise to the levels of the most iconic sport, NFL football, known to mankind, amen? And so we want to talk today about championship mindset. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to our, our, the flesh. It says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought captive to the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Okay, what is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds? What does that mean? Strongholds are thoughts, ideas, and opinions from the world systems, right, that want to flood our minds. Thoughts, ideas, and opinions of the world system that want to flood our minds, right? And so, how do we overcome the world system? How do we overcome those thoughts and ideas that want to flood our minds so that we can act like the world does? Well, 2 Corinthians 10.5 tells us, casting down what? Imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ Jesus. So we do it with what? Our minds, our thoughts, our knowledge of the scriptures. That's how we overcome the strongholds that the world system wants to implement in our minds so that we can go away from Christ and more towards this lost world that we live in, right? How many know that the human mind is the most fascinating and powerful organ or divine instrument created by God for either our good or our detriment? How many know about that? <laughs> How many know? And that's why, you know, I, I have to, I love God's word. And, uh, and every day I'm in the scriptures, I'm in the scriptures, I'm studying the scriptures, I'm meditating, I'm pondering the scriptures, I'm memorizing the scriptures, I'm, I'm uh, living the scriptures, because I recognize that there's a great battle going on in me between the spirit, my spirit, which is engrafted with the Holy Spirit, and my flesh. My flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. So I have to continually, continually feed my spirit with the living. What does 2 Corinthians uh, 3.16 says? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and righteousness that the man of God may be complete and lacking nothing. God's word is inspired. It is living. There are many books that are inspiring, but there's only one book that is inspired. Anybody know the difference between inspiring and inspired? This is God breathed. This is the one that created all heaven and earth and everything in them, speaking to us, wanting to have a relationship with us. Amen? So that's what a, a championship mindset is. Now, we have come up with a, an acrostic, Rebecca and I, an acrostic that has five points, five biblically inspired points that will help us to have a championship mindset. And that acrostic is meals, M-E-A-L-S. Now, M represents meditate. Does anyone know what Psalms chapter 1 says? It's one of my favorite. What, what does it say, brother? Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> huh? Did, 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 that, did that not just touch your heart? Whoa. Yeah, I'm still athletic. Man, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. When you delight in God's word and when you meditate on it day and night, you're going to be like a tree. You're going you're to produce fruit. We are producing fruit here tonight because of the word of God. And guess what? Whatever we do will prosper. Joshua in Joshua 1.8, he told the people of Israel that were entering the promised land, he says, let this book of the law not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night and be careful to observe to do according to all 
that's written therein, then you will have good success, good success and your way will be made prosperous. How many of us want to have good success and have our way made prosperous? Well, what do we do? We confess the scriptures. We meditate the scriptures. We obey the scriptures. Amen? That's a biblically founded principle. Meditate, and then E is examine. And that's in Acts 17, 11. It talks about the Bereans. The Bereans were more noble, and they were people that would ex were excited about re the receiving, receiving the word of God. But you know what they did? They examined the scriptures daily to make sure the things they heard from the apostle Paul, right, were accurate. That's what we need to do. We need to get into the scriptures. We need to examine the scriptures. We need to let God himself speak to us. Not Pastor Tim, not me, not Minister Rebecca, but the God of the word. I'm learning that the more I get into the word of God, the more the God of the word gets into me. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, I'm going to let Minister Rebecca continue. All right, so A is for apply. Um, and what I love about the application of God's word is that he tells us we are not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And as I spend more time in this God-breathed word, I recognize that oftentimes there's a premise and a promise. So I think about Second Chronicles, it said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will repent for their sins, will turn from the wicked ways, that's the premise. The promise is, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. In Proverbs, if you trust Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him. What will he do? He will direct your pathways forward, right? So there's a premise and a promise. Our, we have to apply his word. We have to activate it in our lives. Amen? And then there is listen. And so I love this because I know I'm talking to a lot of business leaders. I'm sure you guys are listening to podcasts and you're listening to different news sources, trying to keep like uh, your cutting edge and keep your finger at the pulse of what's happening in your industry. But we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So how many of us are actually listening to God's word? I love the YouVersion Bible app, and sometimes you can have somebody narrate the Bible to you just to listen to the unadulterated truth, right? Sometimes I'm listening to sermons from the past week, and I'm letting God's word just infiltrate my inner atmosphere, amen? And uh, somebody else mentioned Caleb earlier, like, I love Caleb. Anybody that gets into my vehicle knows there's good, they're going to be listening to Caleb or Air One, and we're going to be listening to the songs, right? But God inhabits the praises of his people. That's the way that I invoke his presence in my life. And so we've got to find different ways to listen to the word of God. And then lastly, to complete meals is study. We all know what it's like to study to show ourselves approved, right? I'm studying to have meetings with my superiors or my subordinates. I'm studying to make sure that my board presentation is completely powerful and poignant, but also succinct, which, you know, my dad and I, we always say we're Holy Spirit long-winded. But we've got to study to show ourselves approved. Amen? So when Pastor Tim is speaking or when you're listening to your local clergy and they're giving you words and things to go back home and, and spend time meditating and examining and applying and listening, and then we have to wrap it all up with studying and being under the tutelage of God's word. There's one last um, S, because as my dad mentioned, we take this all over the world with us, and we, we asked the crowd one day, like, okay, what does S stand for for you all? And somebody said, well, what about serve? And I love serve, and Pastor Tim talked about it earlier from Matthew 28, the greatest among us did not come to be served, but to serve. So Jesus is our example in that, amen? And one of my personal heroes, the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King says that, hey, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And all you need to serve is a heart that is full of grace and a soul that is generated by love. Amen. So that is meals. I saw a couple of you taking pictures, but this is a really powerful way to continue to let the God of the word get into you. All right. Well, um, I'm excited about being before you all this morning. Uh, my dad is a, a tough act to follow, but I just want to say, you know, dad, great job. And thank you so much for sharing your testimony. I think it's just so powerful every time I hear it, although I lived it, when I hear it, I'm reminded that God is so faithful. 
He is so, so faithful and that he will really complete the good work that he has started in each and every one of us. And I just want to remind everybody in here today and also those who are on the live stream that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is not a respecter of persons. So if he did it for my dad, he can and will do it for you. And however you need him to show up, whether it's in your business or in your ministry, in your family, maybe in your body, our God is faithful. He is faithful to call us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. He is faithful to take the one who was the rejected stone and turn him into a cornerstone of a movement. He is faithful. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's not just for him or for me. It's for everybody in this room. We serve a God who is omniscient. He is all-knowing. We serve a God who is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. We serve a God who is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. And let his life be an example of what God can do, right? He will give us beauty for ashes and joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen? And I say that with deep conviction because I have lived it, I have experienced it, and now I'm grateful to be able to share that testimony because we know that that is how we help other people overcome. So I am I'm quickly going to go through a little bit of my story. It's interesting because this is actually the first time that I'm sharing a little bit more about me. I typically kind of hide in, you know, the shadows of greatness here, right? Um, but I'm recognizing that God has given me something to say, and especially to business leaders. I myself am a business leader. I've worked at Ford Motor Company for the last 12 years. Any Ford owners in the building? Okay, thank you for your patronage. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I will start off by uh, sharing. As I mentioned, been working at Ford for the last 12 years, and the night before my interview with Ford Motor Company, um, I packed up all of my items. I was excited because I was gonna go stay at the hotel um, that evening so that I would be prepared. It was like a half day worth of interviews, right, to, to get a job at Ford Motor Company. I was working as the founding project manager for a charter school that was in the northwest part of Detroit. Um, and I was going to pick up, so that morning, I went to pick up about $30,000 worth of checks for our contract employees at the school. And then I commissioned myself to go pick up a card for a colleague whose father had unfortunately passed away. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna go get the card. I'll bring it to the school. Everybody will sign it. We'll have a great moment of comfort and of love and just you know, show this person that we are uplifting her in her time of grief. So I walk into Walgreens, have my phone and my wallet in my hand. And when I come out of Walgreens, I'm like, I don't remember there being glass when I went in on the ground. And I look up and literally my window looked exactly like this. I had been robbed. Somebody came in probably within three minutes of me being in Walgreens and they took everything from my car, my computer, my phone, my outfit that I was gonna wear the next day for uh, the interview. And I literally fell to my knees and felt like Jesus on the cross, like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, you know, this is the night before the biggest moment of my life. I've already had to go through so much. Like, I just want to be fruitful and multiply, Lord. How could you allow this to happen to me, your, your humble servant? So I collected myself on the ground of that Walgreens parking lot. And I remember... A friend of mine um, who I had been attending church with, there was, they were starting to open up afternoon services at the church. So before I went to the police station, before I went back to work, I went to God's house. Because I was like, I know that there's something there for me in God's house. And I sat in the seats, and I was, you know, beside myself, obviously, with emotion. But the bishop looked at me, and he said, everything that you lost, God is going to restore. He didn't know what had just happened. I, didn't even, I wasn't even a member of the church, but obviously he was inspired to give me that prophetic word. And my faith then is not where it is today, but I held on to that word that God said, everything that I lost, he is going to restore. So my dad talked a little bit about mindset, and I had to really dig deep and summon those inner wells of courage to say, you know what? Even though I had just been a victim of larceny, even though it seemed like my entire life was falling apart because they took everything, I am still going to go to that interview tomorrow. I'm going to present myself the best way that I know how, and I can see myself getting that job with Ford Motor Company regardless of what happened to me the night before. So I went home. 
I had a family member pick out a new suit for me, went to a close friend's home, was able to retype my entire case study, as well as print out new copies of my resume and just get in the right mindset that tomorrow I am going to get this job. Funny how as I go through a, a half day of interviews, they're like, the, the last interview of the day, can you tell us about a time that you overcame an adversity? And I'm like, yeah, I've got one right here to let you know. But the beautiful thing about God and how he really does give us beauty for ashes is that the woman who asked me that question was actually the regional manager in the Pittsburgh region. And she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. She came there because, and she, this is what she told me, that she was building a team of champions. And she saw a champion in me, and when I gave her that answer, she said, I knew right away I wanted you to come be a part of my team. So before I even got home from the interview, I learned that I got the job at Ford Motor Company. And literally, God restored my car. I got a new car working for Ford Motor Company. He restored my laptop, my cell phone, and he gave me a new residence. That's the God that we serve. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So that restoration, while Ford was the vehicle to get me to Pittsburgh, and I thought it was just about being restored in these, um, you know, outwardly and earthly possessions, God had something so much greater for me in Pittsburgh. That is where I really met God in a powerful way. I joined a local church. I started serving. I started understanding what it looked like to really um, worship God in spirit and in truth and how powerful of a tool. How many of you all know that worship is our warfare and that praise is a weapon? And I learned that living in Pittsburgh. I learned the power of intercession, of really standing in the gap for other individuals and being able to pray heaven down and watch God not just change situations, but change me in the process of my prayers reaching heaven. The fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous avail as mother. And I learned that while being restored in Pittsburgh. I learned the power of being in God's word. My dad talks about that a lot, but truly it is the light unto our path and the lamp at our feet. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. And I learned how to wield the sword of the spirit in God's word while he was restoring me in Pittsburgh, I developed community with like-minded believers, and we literally chased moves of God from California to Canada, just watching God move and believing him for revival and serving people and loving people. And I'm like, God, you are so amazing. I have encountered you in ways that, I didn't even, that are unfathomable to me. I didn't want to leave Pittsburgh. I'm like, are you just the God of Pittsburgh? Because I haven't experienced you like this in Phoenix or in Michigan. But meanwhile, in the background of me being restored through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm still working. I'm working at Ford Motor Company. I'm developing business acumen. You know, people are starting to know me for my character. She's trustworthy. She's integrous. She's always got a smile and an encouraging word. I didn't really bring my faith all the way to work, but I tried not to code switch, if you will. I tried to be the most, most authentic version of myself. Excuse me. And so... I didn't think I was going to leave Pittsburgh because I had gotten so comfortable in this place of restoration, and I saw God moving through my life, and I thought, okay, I'm just called to the four walls of the church. And then I get a call from that same woman who hired me seven years prior, and she's like, Rebecca, if you want to have any upward mobility in this company, you've got to come back to the headquarters, which is in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm like, I didn't think I was going to go back to Michigan. You know, I wanted to be in Miami or L.A. or D.C. That's where a lot of my fellow Wolverines had gone to begin their lives. And I'm like, what, what's back in Michigan for me? But I obeyed the word of the Lord because I knew that it was something greater than I could see. How many of you all know what it means to walk by faith and not by sight? To believe in the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of those things that we cannot see. I couldn't have seen what God had for me on the other side, but he certainly knew. And I'm so grateful that I obeyed and said yes. So after seven years in Pittsburgh, I moved back to Detroit, Michigan, January 3rd of 2020. So just eight weeks before the axis of the world shifted with the pandemic. And the beautiful thing about th my own redemption is that as the pandemic came and as I was back with my family, God continued to heal us. And I wrote a book, The Power of Prayer, and how it manifests miracles in the lives of millennials. My dad and I started or restarted a podcast, Sharp Talk, and 
first it was just he and I, and people were so encouraged to hear our testimony and to hear the revelation that God had given us. Then we widened the aperture a little bit, and we started interviewing some of his contemporaries and his counterparts, and I loved it because I'm like, we're telling the stories behind the gridiron glory, and people loved it. We had Hall of Famers like Barry Sanders and Eric Dickerson, Dwight Stevenson, Steve Atwater. I mean, and people getting really vulnerable with us on the podcast, talking about some of the struggles that they had to overcome while they were playing at the highest levels of the National Football League. Then, as my dad mentioned, we became ambassadors for the NFL Hall of Fame Health Initiative. So I'm literally traveling the country, <laughs> interviewing these Hall of Fame players, moderating the panels, mo emceeing, just as Pastor Tim is doing today, emceeing these wonderful events. God is using me in such an incredible way. And I'm like, wow, God, this is redemption. This is how you take my pain and turn it into purpose. This is how you take my wounds and allow them to become wisdom. This is how you turn all of the tests and the trauma into a triumph. I, was, I, I just couldn't believe it. It was truly exceedingly and abundantly above all I could have asked, thought, or imagined. But meanwhile, in the background, I am still working at Ford Motor Company, <laughs> and I'm still moving up through the ranks at Ford. But during the pandemic, I'm like, I need more community. So I suggested that we start some spiritual support services for our colleagues, and that's how I learned about the Ford Christian community and the Ford Interfaith Network. And I'm like, wow, this is great. Like, I can really bring my faith to work. And I'm talking to colleagues, and we're praying together, and we're going to Bible study together. We're serving the greater community under the Blue Oval. And I, I was truly enjoying it. It made my work so fulfilling. And then in October of 2023, I get a call and they say, hey, we want you to become the global chairwoman of the Ford Interfaith Network. And I'm like, okay, so what, what exactly does that mean? Well, essentially, you will be setting the strategy for what it looks like for us to include faith in our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy around the globe. I'm like, okay. So I, of course, I prayed and I fasted and I'm calling everybody like, is this actually what I should be doing? I don't know because God is opening all these doors outside of Ford Motor Company and I'm finding a lot of passion and purpose there. But I knew, and somebody else said this earlier, that God had called me for such a time as this to shine his light, to share his love, and to shake his saw at Ford Motor Company. So I boldly and courageously stepped into the role as this global chairwoman of, um, of the Ford Interfaith Network. And it has been a tremendous blessing because I am truly able to be that beacon of God's hope at Ford. And as you all know, we are living in some contentious times. So to be able to really represent our Lord and Savior, and it's so funny because, again, it's interfaith, so there's other faiths that are represented throughout Ford. And people are always like, I just love your energy. And I'm like, that's the Holy Spirit, but thank you so much. I can tell you more about him if you're interested, right? So my life is becoming a living epistle, and God is using me at Ford Motor Company to establish his kingdom and to advance his will and his plan and his purposes on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm so grateful for that. And I will just wrap by saying that we were just in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago um, with the religious Freedom Business Foundation, and they do a lot of work in this faith at work space. And these, this data is so compelling to me because it's talking about the movement around really integrating faith into these diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. And so 86% of Fortune 500 companies are now including religion as part of their broader commitment to DEI. That has doubled since 2022. There's been a 68% increase in the number of these same Fortune 500 companies that have faith-based employee resource groups. Literally, there were only 62 of them, or there were 37 of them in 2022, 62 of them now, and growing in 2024. And this last piece of data came from a Pew survey that four out of 10 Americans say that they've become more spiritual over the course of their lives. And to me, this really represents that the harvest is ripe that there are people who are curious, that there are people who want to know more about this great God that we serve, the great I am. 
And so as business leaders, right, as you guys come to this gas station to get filled up and to go back out into the world, just be mindful that some of our colleagues are never going to step into the wall, the four walls of a church. But they will encounter you and they will encounter me, and that is how they will recognize and encounter our great God. Amen? And I'm not saying that anybody's got to be perfect, but what I am suggesting is that we can allow the fruit of the Spirit to really shine through our lives. Love, joy, kindness, faithfulness, right? And that's what people can say. They will know us by our love, and we have a great opportunity to really advance the things of God. We might not be like Pastor Tim, preachers in the pulpit, but we can certainly be a blessing in the boardroom. Amen? Amen. And God is certainly moving mightily in the marketplace. And so my great commission to each and every one of you and dad, before I have you come up to talk a little bit about our current projects, is to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly, and to cover the world in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. All righty, dad, come on up. Alrighty, so um, one of the things that we have, and we're we're wrapping up here quickly, one of the things that people oftentimes ask us is like, okay, how can we stay connected, or what do you guys have coming up soon? Um, You have such a powerful testimony, and we are finally in the midst of writing a book. (laughs) It has been a very therapeutic, I feel, and cathartic process, and so, um, Dad, I'll let you say a few words about the book, but we would love for you all to stay connected as we finish the book. And one of the things that is so powerful, that uh, the consistent theme that has come up is that he who was expected to die is now teaching others how to live. And we know that the only way that something like that could be possible is because of our great God, right? The great I am, the Lord strong and mighty. Amen? Go ahead, Dad. I just want to say one thing. You know, when you have absolutely nothing to offer, and you are a hopeless, penniless, homeless dope fiend in prison, and God fills you with everything he has to offer, right? And, and, and you go out and you share that with people. People will know that it cannot be you, that it had to be all God. So God is going to get the glory through all of the, what the things that he has us doing. Thanks for letting me share. Absolutely. So, yeah, Sharp Road to Redemption, book coming soon. You'll hear or read more about um, our testimony and the great things that God is doing. But we are just so, so grateful for the opportunity to share with you all this morning. We will actually be back for one of the Savior Summits this fall. So as Pastor Tim told us, that definitely make sure uh, you purchase your tickets. And I just want to bless you all before we go. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance unto you and give you shalom, shalom, shalom. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.